Uh, good evening, everybody. I, I can't tell you how heartening it is to uh, hear a room full of people speaking um, and excitedly, so um, especially all the students who came. So thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is Pamela Smith. I'm a historian of science and director of the Center for Science and Society. And um, I'm thrilled to see you all here. I know you're here for our brilliant thinker, speaker, and activist, Julian Brave uh, Noisecat. Um, and we are very eager to hear what he has to say. But before that, I just want to note that this event continues the Climate and Society series that the center has organized and co-sponsored over the last two years. Um, we are very grateful to our many co-sponsors of the series and the event tonight. I know some of you are here tonight, so thank you very much for your contributions. There will be more events in this series um, that will be announced in the center's newsletter, so please um, sign up for our announcements on our website. Um, this event inaugurates an important new direction for the Center for Science and Society. The center is now seven years old, and we have um, worked to eliminate traditional disciplinary silos. We've tried to create new hubs of interdisciplinary teaching and research, and also to enhance public understanding of science and society. Two years ago, we began an access to knowledge initiative and have been actively working um, to uh, promote anti-racism since then. This year, we launched an initiative in the co-production of knowledge. Now, many of you will ask, what is the co-production of knowledge? And if you Google it, um, you will see that it's in fact a concept in many fields, in healthcare, in environmental science, in anthropology, and other fields. So there are many ways of understanding this concept of co-production, the practice of co-production. Uh, many people think of citizen science in connection with co-production, um, getting lay people involved in scientific research. Um, co-production has of scientific knowledge has been the subject of critical analysis and study by science studies scholars since about the 1980s. And they've highlighted, um, for example, the ways in which knowledge and um, and policy were co-produced by citizen panels at the NIH during the AIDS crisis. Um, they've also um, highlighted the science shops that were founded in Holland that in the 1980s sought to bring in community input in order to direct science research and, um, to, and policy to local concerns. Um, I think that co-production of knowledge is becoming better known, particularly in anthropology and environmental sciences today, but you can see that the graphics at the bottom, which kind of lay out a cycle of co-production, um, come from the um, journals Nature and Science. The Center's initiative in co-production is being led by our new postdoctoral scholars, and two of them, um, Lydia Gibson and Michael Petriello, are involved explicitly in um, the co-production of climate research in the framework of a grant that's led by Ajit Subramanian and Chris Zappa, um, both at Lamont Doherty and also including um, co-PIs from the earth sciences, from journalism, from history, from ethnomusicology, and from anthropology. So it's a great new interdisciplinary um, grant, and this is um, to put together a best practices document. One of the outputs is to put together a best practices document in um, co-production in climate research. Um, the second um, way in which we're promoting co-production um, is through our um, Earth Network, and this is an open network. You can all join, anybody can join, just get in contact with us. Um, we're going to have um, you know, low stakes, informal kinds of get togethers that will um, consider all of the different ways in which we can look at co-production. Um, we also have two other postdocs, um, Hadil Asali and Dilshani Pereira, um, who are both involved as well in climate justice. And co-production is, I think, one of the primary ways that climate justice can be enacted. Um, and speaking as a historian of science, I think that um, justice, not just climate justice, but justice really demands that we understand and disseminate 
the ways in which science and colonialism grew up together, how, in Francis Bacon's word, words, the advancement of the empire of knowledge was intimately entwined with the advancement of European empire over land and resources, including in what the Lenape called Manahata, um, and which Colombia now sits on the um, site of Lenape Hoking, the home place of the Lenape. And it's crucial that we acknowledge the traditional owners and elders past and present of all the lands on which Columbia University operates. And I'll just say, as again as a historian, that humans are the only species capable of constructing their own stories of the past and narrating possible futures. And since the 16th century, that narrative has centered on human agency, uh, have, has presupposed an ever greater separation of humans from nature, and chronicled the development and domination of the earth by humans. Today, however, historians and scientists together are trying to tell a narrative of earth and humanity as a unified whole. Yet, already long ago, Lenape elders told a unified history of the earth and the people. And we can learn from them in order to resuscitate this narrative and to understand ways of being in the world that colonial violence, oppression, and racism has erased and relegated to a so-called primitive past, ways of knowing which now are new and necessary again. So with that, I'm thrilled, really thrilled to introduce Julian Brave Noisecat. Welcome. Julian's work cuts across the fields of journalism, policy, research, art, activism, and advocacy, a very busy person, <laughs> often engaging multiple disciplines at once. Raised in a single mother household in Oakland, California, Julian is a proud member of the Kanim Lake Band to Sesquin and a descendant of the Lilwat Nation of Mount Curry. Just out of high school, Julian interned for Representative Barbara Lee, then studied history at Columbia University and the University of Oxford, where he was a Clarendon Fellow. He led 350.org's US policy work, was an urban fellow in the Commissioner's Office of the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. He is now the Vice President of Policy and Strategy with the think tank Data for Progress and the Narrative Change Director, Director of the Natural History Museum, an artist and activist collective, as well as a fellow at the Tight Media Center, NDN Collective, and the Center for Humans and Nature. His journalism has been recognized with the Livingston Award, as well as the Canadian National Magazine and Digital Publishing Awards, among others. And in 2021, he was named to the Time 100 list of emerging leaders. Julian wrote the foreword to the Indigenous Peoples Atlas of Canada and was invited to consult for the forthcoming general comment on land rights of the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. He has authored and edited many public policy briefs, memos, reports, polls, scorecards, and other works, as well as shaping progressive platforms like the Green New Deal. Please help me welcome Julian Brave Noisecat whose title today is in, entitled Red Herring. Okay. Uh, while we do our tech, which is inherently a bit tricky, wait for hoid up. Julian Brave Noise Cat went Chechua, Sakwakwa, Yana, Statlin, Candidates, Kaskin, which that went to Smokum, which that went. Let one Poopsman, the Elliot Tectomiqua, Echwe, Manahata, Echwe, Lenape, Uluch, when alma mater. Hello, everyone. My name is Julian Brave Noise Cat. Um, my family is Sakwakwa and Statlin. Uh, we come from the Canham Lake Indian Reserve in what is now British Columbia, Canada. Uh, my family also called the village of Shemaquam on the Lillooet River home. And um, I just want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of uh, the Lenape people. Uh, and it's good to be back here at my alma mater. Um, I actually 
graduated from Columbia University with other indigenous students in this very room. Uh, back then, this is the room where they had native grad, uh, so it's really nice to come full circle and to see so many familiar faces, including um, my senior thesis advisors, Professor May Nye, as well as Professor Audra Simpson, uh, who are here tonight, as well as uh, current students in the Native American Council. It really means a lot. Um, I can get it back to the front. It's very appropriate because part of the implicit argument of my talk today is that the indigenous technologies that I'm about to tell you about are a lot more clever than the colonial ones, but we can get there. Okay. All right, this uh, talk, uh, which is also a coyote story called Red Herring, um, is uh, about the, the, the conflict over the herring fishery in a place in southeast Alaska called Sitka. There's this photo of my pa'a, that's my grandfather, checking traps for salmon. About a year ago, my auntie pulled it up on her phone and showed it to me, beaming with pride. To her, it's evidence that her father was a great fisherman and therefore a great Indian. I've wondered at it myself, his 10 gallon hat, his fingers moving nimbly across the net, his belly full of something, maybe fish, but probably beer. Ba'a was a throwback. My dad and I gave him a posthumous nickname, Khan of the Caribou. The Caribou is the region of British Columbia our people call home. Pa'a was a direct descendant of a hereditary chief. He was one of his mother's 14 children. He had an Indian name, Shazik, or just Zeke. He had something like 100 horses, about 20 kids from too many women. He died two decades ago, but on many reservations, if I tell people I'm Zeke's grandson, that means something because Zeke in our world was someone. There's a fi famous line in this native classic, Smoke Signals, when Victor Joseph is trying to teach Thomas Builds the Fire how to be a real Indian. You gotta look like you just came back from killing a buffalo, Victor schools Thomas. Thomas thinks about it for a second. But our people never hunted buffalo. We were fishermen. My pa was a fisherman. And where we come from, that means something. Our Statliunk and Sequetmuk people have been fishing the rivers, the Fraser, the Thompson, the Chilcotin, and the Lillooet, since the trickster coyote liberated salmon as he went about making trouble in the world at the end of the last ice age. Fishing is to our part of the world in the Northwest, as farming was to the Mesopotamians. It's the basis of our civilization. From the Pacific, to the Rocky Mountains, salmon supported some of the most diverse and prosperous ecosystems in the world. The Northwest is home to the largest temperate rainforests on Earth. The soil alone sequesters more than 4.5 billion metric tons of carbon. We have oceans teeming with fish, mountains thick with game, bays, rivers, and valleys populated by the most numerous and sophisticated societies of hunter-gatherers ever known to white anthropologists. <laughs> From present-day Northern California to Alaska, salmon fed an indigenous social system based on feasting and gift giving that's sometimes called the potlatch. Throughout the region, families, clans, and leaders would assert their rights by hosting feasts, dances, and giveaways for one another. Status was measured in generosity. The chief was often the poorest person in their village because they gave so much. In the pantheon of Northwest Indians, the Salish, my people, are kind of like the ancient Macedonians. We took parts of the Northwest culture and we spread them far and wide. But in the scale of things, we were 
not the Greeks and Romans. We were a little bit closer to, in the analogy, the barbarians in our fish-based civilization. We were neither the pinnacle nor the center. The equivalent of the Greeks and Romans lived to our north and west. They were the Quagils, the Haida, the Slinket. Salmon, like almost every vertebrate on the Pacific coast, eat herring. Herring are these little fish that look a lot like their phylogenetic cousins, sardines. In the spring, herring migrate into the shallows to spawn on kelp forests, seaweed beds, and other surfaces. Their arrival brings the coast back to life after the sleep of winter. Seagulls usually announce the herring's approach. Yaw, yaw, the seagulls call out. Yaw. The Thlinket, an indigenous nation from what is now southeast Alaska, take their word for herring from the seagull's tongue. The word is yaw. Heeding the seagulls, whales, seals, sea lions, eagles, salmon, and humans, heeding the seagulls call, all those beings converge to feast on the yaw and their di delicious golden roe, which tastes, I should say, kind of like caviar. The Tlingit serve herring to guests at potlatch, potlatch feasts, specifically the eggs. And those feasts ca are called kuwik in their language. This herring season, my friend Paulette Moreno invited me to Sitka, Alaska for the herring harvest as well as one of those kuwik. I met Paulette during the campaign to make Deb Holland the United States Interior Secretary. Paulette was a source for a story I wrote about how Alaska natives were lobbying their senator, Lisa Murkowski, to vote for Holland's confirmation. Murkowski is an adopted member of the Deshitan clan of the Thlinket, and she's also a Republican. In 2010, Murkowski became one of only two people ever to win a write-in campaign for United States Senate. The other, in case you're curious, was Strom Thurmond. Murkowski won because Alaska natives backed her candidacy over her Tea Party opponent. When we first spoke, Paulette was the grand president of the Alaska Native Sisterhood. The Alaska Native Sisterhood is one of the oldest civil rights organizations in the country. In 1945, Elizabeth Paradovich, then the grand president of the Alaska Native Sisterhood, won a campaign for this nation's first ever state or territory level anti-discrimination statute. When Senator Murkowski voted to confirm Deb Holland, who then became the first ever Native American cabinet secretary, Murkowski's vote was in no small part because of Alaska natives like Paulette and before her, Paradovich. Sometimes we may despair that the sisterhood isn't sufficiently powerful in this country, but not so for the Alaska native sisterhood. You see, Alaska natives in general, and the Thlinket in particular, have a lot figured out when it comes to fish, to culture, and to politics. In the summer of 2021, Paulette showed me around her hometown of Sitka, Alaska. She brought me up to Blue Lake and gave me an Elizabeth Paradovich dollar coin to put in the water. She took me to a traditional but socially distanced Linket birthday party for Luke Nahari, Klan speaker Herman Davis Sr. And she introduced me to the way herring are cultivated by the Linket, not just harvested, cultivated. She explained the important role herring play in a system based on reciprocity for humans and non-humans alike. And she told me about the commercial fishery imperiling these things. She told me about fish, about culture, and about politics. I was hooked. When I returned to Sitka this spring, the Kiksudi clan held a ceremony at Ya Teyi, or the Herring Rock, at least what remains of it, in front of the Sitka Tribal House. Ladies wearing blue robes emblazoned with the story of the Herring Woman 
stood behind the peace hat and the frog hat, some of the Kiksudi clan's sacred atu, or ceremonial regalia. The peace hat was commissioned and gifted to the Kiksudi by the Russian Empire in the early 1900s. The frog hat was carved by Nakusht A, an artist from the Daklawaidi clan in Klakwan, a village on the Chilkat River far to the north. I tell you this to illustrate how Tlingit society is organized. You see, the Tlingit are divided into two moieties, eagle and raven. These, in turn, are divided into clans. Through their clan system, the Tlingit maintain a vast interwoven social network based on generosity, reciprocity, and balance. Eagles marry ravens, ravens marry eagles. Eagles are the guests at potlatches put on by ravens and vice versa. Ravens take care of the sacred idols, items of eagles. The same goes the other way around, and so on and so forth. The Dakloedi are eagles, the Kiksudi are ravens. That's why a Dakloedi artist covered, carved the frog hat for the Kiksudi, and that's why when the Kiksudi began their ceremony, they dressed two of their eagle counterparts from the Kaguantan in the peace and frog hats. Harvey Kitka Sr., a speaker for the Kaguantan, and Professor Thomas Thornton, an adopted Kaguantan, and the author of Herring and People of the North Pacific. Thornton's book, I should add, was a very valuable source for this talk. Presented with the peace hat, Harvey Kitka spoke first. It's not me holding this hat, but my great-grandfather's Rudolph Walton and my grandfather Charlie Daniels Sr. Ganal Chish, which means thank you. The Kiksadi da sang, danced, and prayed. Tommy Gamble, a Kiksadi fisherman, showed the crowd jars of water from 10 different rivers in the area. He called out the Tlingit names of each of those rivers and then poured each jar of water on the herring rock. According to Kiksadi tradition, the first herring were harvested in the hair of a woman who rested her hair on that rock, on Yateyi. Her hair cascaded into the water below, and that's where the herring chose to spawn. When the woman rose from her nap, her hair was caked in their golden row. For countless generations after the first herring woman snared fish eggs in her tresses, the Tlingit have cultivated ya at ya teyi. They take their responsibilities to these fish very seriously. They say that if herring are offended, they will withdraw their consent to be harvested and will not return. Herring, according to the Tlingit, are fish with free will and a strong sense of morality. One story holds that a woman who hoarded herring, pulling the fish out of the water day and night while refusing to, to share with her mother-in-law, which would be her clan opposite, was transformed into an owl as punishment. As one of many signs for their respect for herring, the Kiksadi took the herring rock as a crest, a sacred identifier of their people and their place. They feed guests herring eggs at their kuich, and they pass on the herring woman's names. But over the last century, the Tlingit, the herring, and the traditions that connect them have been almost completely obliterated. The potlatch was outlawed in 1883. In Sitka, the Tlingit held what is often referred to simply as the last potlatch in 1904. The regalia were burned or confiscated for display in museums. Later, in 1971, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act extinguished indigenous claims to land in exchange for cash and private land ownership. In downtown Sitka, the Kiksudi's herring rock was literally blown up to make way for a pier and breakwater. The shard that sits in front of the tribal house is now all that remains. Over those same decades, herring were hunted by an industrial fishery first as raw material to produce oil, fertilizer, and animal feed, and then, beginning in the 1970s, to supply the lucrative market for kazunoko, a delicacy consumed by the Japanese on New Year. 
before the commercial fishing boom, there were seven major herring spawning areas in southeast Alaska. Today, just two remain, part of a global trend for the fish. And as herring die, other fisheries, like salmon, also decline. This decade, king and silver salmon fisheries have collapsed in multiple parts of Alaska, like the Yukon River, Cook Inlet, and the Copper River, leading some fishermen to protest the herring fishery. As a consequence of the herring's decline, the flow of nutrients up the food chain and inland through salmon runs is also waning, pretending a future wherein the once magical Northwest isn't quite so magical. Until recently, the herring fishery had a certain Wild West feel. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game would give the state's 48 herring permit holders, owners of the most expensive fishing permits in all of Alaska, just two hours notice before the opening each spring. Saners and tenders would motor out to the spawning grounds in an armada. A fish and game official would count down from 10 over radio and then fire off a gun, horse race style. The boats would slam the throttle, encircling and netting the fish. Aboard commercial herring boats, females are cut open for their valuable sacro, the part of the herring consumed by the Japanese. Males, which have little commercial value, are slaughtered and often dumped. A few years before the pandemic, one set could net a boat of half a dozen men $1 million. Sitka's fishery was even fe featured in an episode of National Geographic's Cowboys of the Sea. At present, a more corporate mindset has taken hold. The Japanese don't consume as much kazunoko as they used to. Younger generations don't have the taste for it the way their elders do. As the market has tightened, the fish processors that purchase herring and lend to the fishermen have encouraged permit holders to cooperate. All but a few are now part of, part of a co-op where insaners work together, keeping costs low while making revenues more stable and predictable. On the day the Kiksuti prayed over what's left of their herring rock, I remember looking out across the sound at the gulls squawking in a herring-induced frenzy, while below the saners, the flinket, and the fish all regrouped. Paulette and others brought me out and showed me the ingenious and otherworldly art of herring cultivation. According to archaeological evidence, herring cultivation dates back at least 10,000 years, meaning the Thlinket were harvesting herring long before the Greeks, the Romans, or even the Mesopotamians existed. Here's how they did it. Before the herring arrive, young western hemlock trees, preferably ones close to shore with straight, waxy fibers, are harvested. The trees are lightly prepped to go in the water. They're tied up, they're fitted with weights and buoys, and then they're loaded onto skiffs. When the time is right for the herring to venture close into shore, the trees are submerged in the water to create an artificial spawning habitat that augments the natural one. But the trees aren't put into the water until the time is right. You see, the Tlingit have been observing herring behavior for thousands of generations. They know things that Western science does not. In fact, when it comes to herring, Western science is still playing catch up with indigenous knowledge. For example, when the herring come in to spawn, the older males go first to scout out the area. Herring often return to the same spawning grounds, but they're flighty and they reassess cycle to cycle. The Thlinket like to give the fish their space. In fact, watchmen used to patrol the waters to make sure people did not disturb the spawn until it was time. Harvesters only drop trees after elder males release their pre-spawn milt, which turns the waters milky. Paulette has her own term 
for these spermy conditions. Jizzin, she says, as in, it's jizzin out there. <laughs> On a Wednesday in herring season, Harvey Kitka Sr. picked me up in his minivan. We hit the McDonald's drive through for a Sprite and a crispy chicken sandwich, our subsistence spot, he joked. And then we drove from one end of town to the other. Oceans used to be teeming with fish, Harvey said. As far as you could see, herring flipping. Harvey narrated the history of fish, people, and place at the time scale that he looks at things. He began at the Ice Age with the clan migrations from Kicks Bay. Sitka sits across the sound from a volcano called Mount Edgecombe. The ancestors of the Kiksuti were originally drawn to the area by volcanic activity. Some, like Harvey, say it was a seal hunter who first spotted the place. Responding to periods of volcanism, the Kiksuti moved their villages around, but stayed in the area, becoming Shitka, people on the outside of Baranoff Island in the Tlingit language. The Russians built a fort at Staragavan on the north side of Shitka in 1799. The Tlingit chased them off. In, in 1904, sorry, in 1804, there was a big fight between the Russians and the Kiksuti. The Kiksuti went into exile for two years. When they returned from the forest, they made peace with the Russians. Harvey's clan, the Kaguantan, is the largest Tlingit clan. After the Tlingit discovered the Russians, the Kaguantan decided to establish a village at Kit Gushihin, the killer whale stream, to trade with these outsiders. Harvey's father was a big man for the Kaguantan. Staragavan, the place where the Russians built their first fort before being chased off, is a spot where Harvey first harvested herring. As we drove, Harvey told me herring were once so plentiful that the Thlinket used to use a special rake to skim the fish off the top of the water. But it's not like that anymore. Harvey took me south of town to Silver Bay to show me why. You see, Silver Bay is named after the herring that used to populate it. The bay was a spawning site that was actually created by Thlinket, who brought hemlock trees with branches into the area to encourage the herring to return there. Harvey actually did this, and he knows another guy who did it before him. That guy's name was John Duncan, and Harvey says John liked to call the herring his girlfriends. And before John, I'm sure the herring had another boyfriend, but Harvey doesn't know the fish's full dating history. According to Harvey, John's girlfriends once stayed in Silver Bay year-round, meaning they weren't actually migrating out into the Pacific. There were so many and there was so much food around that they stayed right there. But that was before wastewater from a pulp mill contaminated the bay in the 1960s. After the loggers moved on, the mill was replaced by a fish processor called Silver Bay Seafoods. About a decade back, Harvey planted branches with eggs in Silver Bay. And when the fish returned, the Department, and Fish and G the Department of Fish and Game reopened the area to the commercial guys. Saners, Silver Bay Seafoods, and nearby hatcheries, which released dog, pink, and king salmon, fish who eat herring yearlings, have so far prevented the silver fish from making a comeback. Now, Silver Bay isn't so silver. Down at the docks, I clambered aboard a Depression-era vessel called the Ellie, captained by 39-year-old Steve Johnson. The Ellie is outfitted with a little skiff, but the skiff's motor was broken, so when Steve's crew went out to pull trees, they had to row like the old days. According to Department of Fish and Game lingo, Steve 
is a super harvester. He's on the water about 270 days per year. He set 73 trees in 2022, yielding literally thousands of pounds of herring eggs. And he likes to teach. The day I came out, he had two Yupik men on the boat with him. But interestingly, in recent years, many of his students have been white. Herring hippies, Steve calls them. I don't mind. I'll teach anybody how to do this. As long as you're willing to work, be safe, and follow directions, I'll teach you. Steve pointed the bow of the Ellie North, and we motored out of town past a mountain called Dachet. We kept looking for herring, which were nowhere to be found until we reached Nakwasina Bay, where Steve gave up and started looking for seals to shoot instead. At Nakwasina, a mountain called Anahuts towers over the site of Steve's ancestral summer village. In the Alpine, Steve and other Thlinkets say you can still see the rock breakwaters built by the Thlinket during the last Ice Age's floods. On the shoreline, you can see where rocks were leveled for canoe landings and houses. In the 1920s, the Navy and the Forestry Service burned down villages like that one to create Tongass National Forest. But the Thlinket way of life is coming back. Steve tries to live how his grandfathers and his grandfather's grandfathers lived. I think our way of life is better than the Western way, he told me. A lot of it is difference in worldview. Western culture is focused on giving status for what you are or what you own. Native culture is focused on what you give back and give away. Humans aren't supposed to be super capitalistic and hoarding. Most civilizations are based on helping each other. But puttering around his ancestral bay, Steve couldn't find any herring, any seal, or any other things that were once plentiful to give back. As we turned around, he offered a poem instead. The Red Herring. Does he cross the mighty bearing? Nobody knows what he sees, but his eggs taste good to you and me. Oh, the mighty herring, he cannot fight. He only lives because of flight. Everything in the sea waits to eat thee, but he is still oh so free. Come with me and cut a tree and herring eggs there will be. The weak commercial fisherman caught a record 20,000 tons of herring. Paulette brought me out on her friend Matt's dory to harvest. As we motored out, the clouds were breaking, but during herring season, conditions can change fast. Herring weather, they call it. Near Middle Island, we passed Steve Johnson and the crew of the LV, Ellie harvesting herring eggs in their rowboats. From them, we scored some sandwiches. After lunch, Paulette threw a grapple at some kelp. As the line dragged behind the boat, it got stuck in the propeller. Matt killed the engine and dropped anchor. As the waves heaved the dory towards the rocks, we tried to untangle the prop. A few dangerous minutes passed. And then suddenly it was loose, and off we motored again through Crow Pass to the far side of Permissila Bay. The weather shifted from rain to hail to sunshine, back to rain to sunshine, and then to hail. We came upon Paulette's honey, Andrew Roberts. He was pulling up a tree from what Paulette calls a protection set, a set of hemlock trees put in the path of the saners intentionally. Once harvesters set trees in an area, according to the Department of Fish and Game, commercial fishermen are not supposed to disturb them. The protection sets were thick with golden roe. We pulled them up using our body weight leverage in the motor and we cut off the branches, stacking them high in our totes until the boat was heavy with limbs so thick with spawn they look like bear claws. 
The rest we returned to the water so the fish would return to. As we motored back to town, we stopped to cut a few herring egg loaded fronds of kelp off a kelp tree. A crab wearing a crown of herring eggs clambered aboard. You know what, Paulette said as we pulled back into town? This is why our people are going to be all right. Because we got the spirit. It's in our spirit. That week, Bert Jackson from Cake brought a boatload of herring egg trees back to his village in the hope that in a few years, the fish might return there too. The Flinket saw a lot less herring in the sea. 2022 was a better year than the ones immediately before, but according to the harvesters, things still looked precarious. Whales and sea lions now come up to Alaska from California. They eat a lot of herring. So do hatchery salmon. There was a diesel spill north of Sitka during the spawn. It's unclear how that impacted the fish. And it is also unclear what effect climate change is having. What is certain is that commercial fishermen also chase herring eggs. They pluck thousands of tons of fish out of the sea before they can even spawn. And everywhere that commercial sacro fishery has gone in Southeast Alaska, the herring have been brought to the brink. Sitka is the only place where enough fish remain to even conduct a commercial fishery. And the herring that have survived don't act like their ancestors. Perhaps this is because fewer males make it past age five, or perhaps it's because the fish have to dodge a high octane fleet before they spawn, or maybe there's something else happening out in the warming, plastic-filled Pacific that harvesters and scientists don't yet see. Whatever the reason, the herring have become less predictable, making local knowledge less valuable, while the harvest becomes more challenging and expensive. As gas prices soar, subsistence isn't so cheap. Which makes you wonder why, in 2022, the Department of Fish and Game authorized a more than 45,000 ton herring harvest, the largest herring harvest ever. When they showed up to the Board of Fish meeting in Anchorage last March, the Sitka Tribe of Alaska and an allied activist group called the Herring Protectors were wondering the same thing. The Board of Fish is a seven-member governing body that makes decisions about how Alaska's fisheries are managed. The seven members of the board are appointed by the governor, but the rules and reforms they evaluate are submitted by fishermen, tribes, and everyday citizens. The board holds its major convenings in the Anchorage Convention Center. Upstairs, there's Thursday night at the fights where aspiring boxers and MMA stars try to knock each other's teeth out. Downstairs, over rows of chairs, tables, and cheap catering, Everyone with the stake in the state's fisheries dukes it out. The Board of Fish is a venue where technocracy holds sway, but where personal relationships, political theater, and side deals truly rule. The Department of Fish and Game makes many of its decisions based on formulas. Those weren't created until the late 20th century when the state attempted to quantify populations of fish like the herring for the first time. By then, herring had already been decimated, meaning that in broader historical context, the context with which the Flinket look at things, the baselines the department uses are actually too low. Many formulas and data sets also haven't been updated in decades. The ones used to determine the herring harvest, for example, haven't changed since 1997. That formula is written on microfiche, Steve Johnson tells me. It's a joke, except it's also true. In years past, the Board of Fish has dismissed Flinket concerns, but this year, the Board appeared to be aware of the shortcomings in their model 
and their blind spots as a governing body. Board members were friendly to the tribe. Harvey Kitka, who had been going to board meetings a long time, said the March convening was the first where he actually felt listened to. Privately, an insider friend told me, at least one new board member was sympathetic to the tribe's case. So when it was her turn to give a public comment, Paulette did not miss the opportunity for some political theater. Rocking one of her signature hats, Paulette laid a basket full of herring eggs before the board. The three minute testimony tr timer doesn't begin until you start talking and Paulette knew that. So she took her time getting her props in place. Then she began, I am of my mother's people. I am a harvester of what lies before you. And I will not speak of something unless they are in the room. She held a branch caked in row aloft. This is what we are speaking of. By the March meeting, the 45,000 ton herring quota could not be changed. What could, however, was the way the formula in particular and the fishery in general was managed moving forward. In policy terms, those were the real card fights. The Sitka tribe and an industry group sneakily called the Southeast Herring Conservation Alliance each came armed with three proposals. The tribe's proposals geared towards herring conservation were numbered 156, 157, and 158. Proposal 156 would require the Department of Fish and Game to close the fishery if their model forecasted the herring population at less than 25,000 tons. 157 would set a limit on the number of older males that could be harvested. According to traditional knowledge, elder males play an important role in a successful spawn, as you now know. 158 would require the Department of Fish and Game to close the fishery if fish older than five were less than or equal to 20% of the model's forecasted population. The industry's counterproposals, on the other hand, would allow saners to take more fish while making it harder for traditional harvesters to get their herring eggs. Proposal 159 would repeal the regulation requiring the Board of Fish to manage herring for both commercial and subsistence interests. This would, in effect, pull the rug out from a lawsuit that has been filed by the Sitka Tribe of Alaska alleging that the Department of Fish and Game has not managed the sacro fishery for subsistence interests. 160 would reopen core areas of the herring spawn in Sitka Sound that have been closed to the commercial fishery, and 161 would require subsistence harvesters to secure permits to harvest eggs on branches. Many harvesters said that this would effectively criminalize their culture because they could be fined if they did not have a proper permit to go out and practice their traditions. One after another, hundreds of citizens, many of them activist herring protectors, testified against the Southeast Herring Conservation Alliance's proposals and in support of the Sitka Tribe of Alaska's. The herring hippies, to use Steve's term, outnumbered the industry 10 to 1. And when Paulette finished speaking, it felt like the tide was turning. Then, Jared Godfrey, a Board of Fish member, asked a question. So, on the branch that you have showed that is full of eggs, is that dried and attached? Or do you actually have to attach the eggs to the wood artificially? Paulette smiled, giggled a little, passed the eggs around the table to the board before launching into an end-to-end -end explanation of herring cultivation. Before she could finish, Another board member butted in. I should have asked before I ate the herring eggs that got passed around, but were those okay to eat? <laughs> While tribal leaders, industry executives, and state regulators were focused on the fight in Anchorage, harvesters confided in me that they were concerned about a stealthier threat, the herring egg thief. 
Steve Johnson said about half of his 73 trees were stolen. Paulette didn't set quite that many, but lost a similar proportion. Jim Nielsen set 15 and lost nine. Theft is becoming more of a problem, Jim told me. People don't want to do the work. Everyone had a theory of who'd done it. Maybe it was one of the out-of-towners who didn't have eggs to harvest in their own base. Maybe it was a harvester who had promised to fill too many freezers. Maybe it was a guy who was dealing eggs. I was told a freezer box of, egg, of herring eggs could fetch as much as $600 on the black market. At least one herring egg dealer had served hard time. And one harvester was even accused by others of making his living off the illicit trade. Or maybe, said others, it wasn't a native, but a spiteful saner. A couple fishing boats had given out eggs on branches to community members one weekend in an effort to repair race relations. But when had those white guys learned to set trees? No, no, said others. Those trees, those trees were set directly in the flow of treated sewage that drains into Sitka Sound. Those eggs were not stolen. They were poopy. Paulette's honey, Andrew, recorded a suspicious figure up, un unloading a boat in the middle of the night. His footage looked like one of those grainy Bigfoot videos. He showed it to a few trusted friends, ones who'd been ruled out in the town-wide game of herring egg clue. But none of them could make out the man or his boat. Meanwhile, I kept waiting for someone to be transformed into an owl. That is, as noted earlier, the old Tlingit sentence for greedy harvesters. But so far, no one has gone poof and hooted off just yet. The Tlingit Grinch remains at large. The evening Paulette gave her testimony, three Board of Fish members, Godfrey, Woods, and Mitchell, approached Harvey and the Sitka tribe's leadership. Their offer, an off-record hotel room meeting with them and the Saners. Harvey and the tribe were under the impression they would be meeting with a friendly group of Saners who had put forward a proposal number 164 that would make the Sacro fishery an equal split permanently. But that appears to have been a misunderstanding at best or more likely a bait and switch. Because when tribal leaders showed up at the Captain Cook Hotel, they were face to face with the Southeast Herring Conservation Alliance. And by then, there was no retreating from the ambush. The Board of Fish made clear that if the two parties did not come to some sort of compromise right then and there, their obstinance would influence the board's votes. Now, based on my understanding of Board of Fish rules, I'm not entirely sure this meeting was kosher. You see, a majority of Board of Fish members cannot gather outside the Board of Fish structure. Otherwise, such a meeting constitutes a secret meeting, according to the Department of Fish and Game. Usually, three board members would not constitute a majority of the seven-person board, except that in 2022, the Board of Fish had a vacant seat. But this is just how the Board of Fish does business, through side meetings and side deals. There are thousands of ways to influence this process, my insider friend told me. The testimony is a sideshow. But before 2022, the Tlingit had only ever been invited to the sideshow. Now they were in the title fight. And the truth was that they were outmuscled and outfinessed. The industry had been working processes like this for decades. They knew every single one of the thousands of ways to influence the Board of Fish. So when the tribe and the industry walked out of that hotel room, both had agreed to set aside their three proposals the industry-friendly status quo would remain. Tlingit reactions were mixed. I'm very concerned, said Harvey. 
I don't know how we can tell commercial industry or the Department of Fish and Game to conserve and then they give them more to fish. It's hard to make them understand. Until the next Board of Fish meeting, the Sitka tribe must look elsewhere to protect herring. They still have their lawsuit that alleges the Department of Fish and Game has not managed herring for subsistence. They also have a letter on the desk of Interior Secretary Deb Holland asking the Interior Department to take extraterritorial jurisdiction over Sitka Sound to protect herring. They, took, they look also to the unsettled parts of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which did not legislate tribal water rights. They're mulling some sort of action at the United Nations, but more than any of these things, they're looking within toward a future when the Tlingit themselves reassert their sovereign relationship, nation to nation and clan to clan with the herring. And maybe, maybe it's not the Saners, the Board of Fish, or even the Tlingit who have the final say. Maybe it's the herring, a fish, according to indigenous science, with a strong sense of how they should and should not be governed that will have the final say. Mount Edgecombe, the volcano, was rumbling for the first time in years when the Kiksudi gathered for their Ya Kuich, their herring potlatch. Most potlatches these days are held to memorialize the dead, but this one was held to celebrate the herring and the Tlingit way of life. The Kiksudi brought out their peace hat, made fire dishes for the ancestors, called out the clans in attendance, and danced. Their guests reciprocated. Joel Jackson from Cake thanked the Kiksudi for the branches that went back to his village, and he asked for permission to bring more next year. Until we see herring filling our bay, he said. That's my dream. I'm starting to sound like Martin Luther King, he said. And then he laughed. Then the Kiksudi brought out five women wearing herring robes, with the story of the herring woman stitched on their backs. A male dancer, dressed in, blood red in a blood red shame robe, representing the commercial sacro fishery, danced circles around each herring lady, lady. One by one, the women spun off the dance floor, disappearing like the herring fisheries that used to dot the coast from California to the Arctic, until one remained. She danced with the industry man. She started to spin like the others, but then it was he who was sent off the floor. Someday, perhaps not long from now, the Kiksudi might be vindicated by science, by declining Japanese demand for Kazunoko, by policy, by the rising tide of environmentalism, by changing values, by the herring themselves. Our culture is here to stay, said Louise Brady, a Kiksudi herring woman and the leader of the Herring Protectors Activist Group. This is our vision as people. We need to come together in order for our oceans and this world to survive. I didn't grow up fishing, but in recent years, I've started descending the ancient canyon trails to dip sockeye from the rushing river like my pe'a, his pe'a, and all our pe'as before, stretching back to the era of glaciation and coyote. As I've taken up the net, I've started asking my dad about his fishing stories. He told me about the days and nights he spent down at Farewell Canyon on the Chilcotin River with Pa'a, his brothers, and men who were like brothers. He told me about the time one of the fishermen spotted a moose cresting the trail, grabbed a rifle, and gunned it down. The behemoth staggered and tumbled all the way down the canyon into the river. He told me about the time his Pa'a and his partner, Willie Frank, swore they saw a UFO come down from outer space and hover right there in front of their truck. They're trying to steal our technology. When our Uncle Percy was on his deathbed, my dad and I went down to Farewell Canyon. We said a prayer and watched our ancestral enemies, the Chilcotin, fish on the far side of the river. Recently, during one of our nights bullshitting about fish at the dining room table, I took out that photo of Pe'a checking the nets. Dad recognized it immediately. In fact, he took it, so he told me the story. Pa'a and Dad were driving the road to the old village of Skugumchuk on the Lillooet River. Pa'a spotted a trap, so he pulled over, 
and told dad to keep watch. While Pe'a was trying to rob salmon in the net of a more diligent and honest fisherman, a fisherman who was almost undoubtedly one of his own people, if not one of his own family, my dad snapped this photo. If you look close, you can see Pat is wearing cowboy boots, not the best footwear to clamber down slippery rocks to the treacherous river. His wranglers and his collared shirt are fish slime free. He's got on his best hat. His lips turn up in what I imagine was a devious grin. You see, as it turns out, in the parable of the red herring, a story that I believe could stand in for many others about indigenous peoples, industries, and natural resources, I am descended from someone more akin to the herring egg thief than the herring egg protector. Perhaps, as the Thlinkets say, it's not me telling this story, it's my Pa'azik. And you know what? I love that. Because my people aren't just descended from hereditary chiefs. We're made in Coyote's image, too. Right now, we are living through an epoch of geological change even more tumultuous than the Ice Age, when tricksters and transformers walked among us. I believe that if this is truly the era when we save herring, our way of life, and much else, those tricksters and transformers are also going to return. If we look at the world and these stories the way our ancestors would, perhaps they already have. Chuck F. Cook's gem. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I know there are lots of questions. I have questions myself. Um, but I want to actually start with some of our wonderful, brilliant postdocs. Um, if you have questions, if you'd like to start. Hi, Julian. Thank you so much for an incredibly generative and immersive talk. Um, I was just so moved by the stories um, that you told us, that you shared with us from Paulette, from Harvey, the way that you brought us into Sitka, Alaska, um, and, and thinking through um, all, all of it, the, the fact of testimony at the Board of Fish, um, the, the stories about herring cultivation. And I just wanted to ask you whether you could reflect on the political potential of storytelling, particularly as someone who um, works in a number of different genres, um, from policy to activism, um, and yeah, how you see the political potential of storytelling. In my view, um, effective politicians and effective policymakers are good storytellers, um, and in the most basic sense, having looked at and worked on a lot of polls, including with um, my colleague Danielle, who uh, worked with me at Data for Progress, what polling tells you on the most basic level is that politics is now a form of entertainment, um, which is a kind of dark insight, but it's also the reality of politics blazing on social media and our televisions 24 seven. And the people who are able to attract the most eyeballs and tell the most compelling stories uh, that appeal to the most number of voters are the ones who have the greatest probability of, of winning in that game. Um, as a person who comes from uh, a people and a race uh, whose story has been long and very much maligned, I also believe that telling stories well and in the right way, in a way that's also true to the people and places they come from, has, uh, at least on the personal, if not on a political level, transformative potential. And a big part of making 
Deb Holland, the Interior Secretary, was telling her story in a way that was both true to who she is and the community she comes from, and also in a way that was persuasive to the decision makers uh, in Washington, D.C., who ultimately decide who the members of the United States cabinet were. So those were people like Lisa Murkowski, who, uh, as I kind of allude to, was very cross-pressured on Deb Holland's appointment. On the one hand, Murkowski comes from one of the largest oil producing states in America. All Alaskans get a dividend, actually, from oil revenues in Alaska. So this is one of the biggest um, industries in Alaska. And on the other hand, um, Murkowski is not just adopted by a Thinket clan, uh, but actually 20% of voters in Alaska are Alaska natives. And the reason that Lisa Murkowski, as sort of a center-right Republican, is able to continuously win that Senate seat is in large part because Alaska Natives, who tend to prefer the Democratic Party when they vote, um, have decided to vote strategically for Murkowski so that they don't get a far-right alternative, which is what happened in 2010, and which, if she wins again this year, is likely what's going to happen in Alaska. Um, and a big part of convincing Murkowski was highlighting and elevating that story so that she, when presented with the choice between do I side with the oil industry and the, my party, who all voted against Deb Holland's nomination, uh, and Alaska Native voters, she actually chose to side with on this issue, Alaska Native voters, which, you know, I mean, most stories about big oil and indigenous peoples don't end up with indigenous peoples winning, but that one actually did. I'm so glad you asked that question because, you know, one of, you talked about <coughs> changing values and how you sounded very optimistic about the fate of the herring. Um, uh, and, I, you know, the question is really how does change happen, right? How do you change values? And storytelling is a really important part of that, as you've pointed out. I mean, it ha can have political consequences. Uh, uh, so thank you, Dilshani. Thank you very much. Um, Mike, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Um, I'll just echo Dilshani's comments there. Um, thank you for coming in. It's been a real joy and privilege to listen to your talk today. Um, as I was trying to think of a lot of the questions that were coming to mind for me and the best way to formulate them, um, I kept on coming back to one thing that you said in the talk that really resonated with me, particularly as someone who's really thinking a lot about co-production and different forms of knowledge. And you mentioned that in relation to the unpredictability of the herring populations that change the value of the local knowledge about those populations. And so I was wondering if you'd be able to unpack that a little bit. And in particularly going back to um, Pamela's comment about values and, and where that was coming from for you and also from the perspective of the people that you were working with. Yeah, so I think it depends on the, the scale that you're looking at the herring. So at the macro level, the knowledge that um, herring schools behave in a way that is true to the Thlinkett's description of them, uh, essentially the, the uh, recognition of the reality that the older males do actually go scout out the, the spawning grounds, could in theory lead to, at the, at the macro scale, um, like at the scale of, of, of Sitka Sound as a whole or Southeast Alaska, could lead to better management of herring populations. And that would be a way that indigenous knowledge ahead of Western science led to better governance of a resource for everybody. Um, at the micro scale, uh, what's happening uh, based upon the interviews that I conducted with a lot of different people who actually go out and set uh, hemlock trees uh, to go get herring eggs, is that because there's basically all this disruption to the herring spawning behavior because they have to dodge this um, fleet of saners before they come in to spawn, they're doing what any hunted fish or animal will do, which is that they are flighty and they're, they, they get scared and they, they don't necessarily will return to the same places that they once did, which means if you are someone who's set trees year after year 
the knowledge from one year to the next of, oh, I'm gonna go here to set my trees because I know the herring are gonna return there is less reliable because the herring themselves are getting caught and slaughtered in mass before they get the opportunity to do that. So they're maybe not necessarily even getting to return to some of these places. So what's interesting is that at the, at the state or regional or um, local level, like this indigenous knowledge could be very useful to managing this fishery, but for individual harvesters, because of all of the other things that are creating chaos for the fish, um, knowledge is becoming less valuable. And I've also been told that climate change factors into this as well. So there used to be other indicators that would happen um, on the land that I didn't mention that would tell people, oh, it's like coming to be herring season and those things are no longer synced up in the way that they, that they were or would have been, um, which also makes like year to year, generation to generation knowledge less useful in uh, feeding yourselves and your, and your family. And has there been any recognition on the part of the Board of Fish of um, indigenous knowledge in this area? I mean, is, are there any movements for co-production? I mean, I think of the Columbia River, um, for example, in which the, uh, I think it's the University, Washington, uh, University of Washington Research Center has actually been now put into th in the control of the um, uh, region in order to, you know, to do research, so it's not necessarily policy, but it should be research that leads to policy. Um, so there's an, there's an explicit recognition about um, how important um, both indigenous input as well as um, indigenous knowledge is, in, at least in that example. And is there anything like that in Sitka? So what I was, part of what drew me to this story, as I sort of alluded to at the beginning, was that I think that Alaska Natives have a lot figured out when it comes to dealing with colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, and what was interesting about this story to me was that there was a lot of components that would make you think that this, um, the Sitka tribe of Alaska would get some sort of um, compromise out of the Board of Fish. Yeah. Like even mm -hmm. at the Board of Fish, it, yeah. it seemed as though the board was, mm -hmm. you know, like aware that there was an issue. And yeah. um, I didn't mention this, but the Board of Fish actually was is, is chaired by an indigenous woman. Huh. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting yeah. situation. Uh, but for various reasons, there wasn't, yeah. uh, that, that outcome did not mm -hmm. end up happening. Um, which I also think is like makes it an interesting case study mm -hmm. for me because often people mm -hmm. you know select case studies on the I think it's social sciences say on the dependent variable I believe um, so like if you just study the case studies where people successfully yeah. win the change yeah. that you want mm -hmm. like you actually won't really fully understand and I think you know uh, part of it had to do with uh, the activist group the herring protectors. Uh, had a harder line than the tribe, and they were the ones who had brought the most people mm. to the Board of Fish. And essentially their, their view, if you asked them, which I, is a view that I, um, in theory, agree pretty strongly with, is that the Board of Fish process is a colonial process, mm -hmm. and that their ultimate goal is for the Flinket to be managing these fish, not the yeah. Board of Fish. Uh -huh. um, and that is associated with a whole set of values, you asked about values, that the herring are embedded within, mm -hmm. and that in their view, the herring cannot be set. Um, although there is the deep irony that, as I also mentioned, the, the base of the herring protectors is majority non-native. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, the world is a weird and complicated yes, place. Yes, right. Um, more questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. It was really great to, to think and, and feel along with those stories. I, thinking about this question of co-production of knowledge, I was struck um, by the point you made about um, the, you know, in this meeting, despite the 
what sounded like really very deep knowledge being presented about the the trees in the meeting itself that subsequently in the off the record meeting you know a whole lot of other kind of knowledge came to the fore which is to say mm -hmm. you know as you mentioned the thousand ways of influencing these particular political and legal processes so I was curious I suppose whether there are characters in this story or folks in the community working with the tribes who are um, I get, if it's appropriate to say so, tricksters in that respect, right? Folks who understand those kind of colonial legal processes and, le and political processes who mm -hmm. are in a position to effectively advise the tribes or, you know, fill them in about how that side of this knowledge works or is that something that hasn't emerged yet? Um, it's a great question. Uh, that is like my implicit, part of the implicit point about the trickster thing at the end. And the answer to that is no, that has not happened quite yet. Although um, I, I am hopeful, given the track record of the Tlingit in particular and the Alaska Natives in general elsewhere, that that will end up happening and will happen in a way that helps protect herring and the, the harvest around it. But for various reasons, uh, has not actually happened yet. Hi, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. So my question is more on the general side. As someone who is also um, indigenous, when it comes to activism, I find myself dealing with burnout. Like there's this constant pressure to be the one to speak on indigenous issues when they're talked about um, in a classroom setting and especially at Columbia. But like your talk today like gave me hope, especially Paulette's point on um, we're going to be all right, it's in our spirit, but I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to deal with activism burnout. Yeah, I mean, one of the, um, I too was once a young student activist at Columbia. <laughs> and, um, you know, one of the things that I think is really important to me uh, that is maybe sometimes not reflected in places where people are advocating for things uh, is a sense of family and, and community. Um, you know, it, it can be very challenging to come up against um, systems and decision makers who would prefer not to change and would prefer not to listen. And that's why I think it's so important um, to spend time with family and community and people who do listen and do care and do take care of one another. Um, and my reflection on having done activisty type things for a while is that unfortunately a lot of activist um, communities and spaces do not perform that. Um, there's a lot of uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of the sort of posture that activists have towards structures and systems of power end up, from my personal experience and observation, being used with one another, which is not a great way to relate to other human beings on a day-to-day -day basis and to create community. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, as <laughs> so many uh, previous uh, folks have spoken up for taking the time to speak with us on your experiences. Um, I guess my question kind of teeters back to uh, the Alaskan political uh, relations in the area um, with Mary Potola uh, winning the special election and just now, um, let me gather my thoughts, thoughts for a second. Uh, so Senator Murkowski uh, backed uh, Patola uh, for, the, uh, for the November election. And I guess my general question is with um, an Alaska native uh, having representation of the state of Alaska for the first time ever, um, and this seemingly bipartisan, uh, consistent relation. Um, what do you anticipate uh, would be the uh, near future 
of Alaskan politics and its relation to Alaskan indigenous people? Yeah, I mean, my overall impression is that Alaska Natives are very pragmatic and effective at winning the kinds of concessions that they want and need from a constrained political context. Um, part of that has to do with the fact that Alaska Natives are a pretty significant portion of the state's population and therefore its voting population. And that also has to do with the fact that um, from my own time in Alaska, like the Alaska Federation of Natives just met this past week. And there is a degree to which people across the state, um, Alaska Natives across the state, really truly are connected with each other and communicating about um, their, their regional, tribal, and shared state level challenges and figuring out ways to collaborate and work together with the knowledge that they're a minority, but with the knowledge that if they actually do figure out how to get on the same or similar pages, they have a track record of you know, un, unseen and unacknowledged success that includes you know, the first ever state or territorial level anti-discrimination law in the nation's history that includes arguably being the reason why we have the first Native American cabinet secretary and now includes um, you know, the, the first ever Alaska Native member of Congress who comes from the Democratic Party which, you know, it's been a while since a Democrat has won a statewide office in Alaska. And all of that has to do, at the end of the day, with Alaska Natives being pretty good at politics, right? So, like, I, don't, I can't predict the future and look into the crystal ball. People say that it's going to be a bad election year for Democrats, and historically that's going to be true. But Alaska is also different from the rest of the country. Um, so it'll probably be hard for Peltola to hold on to that seat, but with Markowski's endorsement and you know the fact that Palin is still on the ballot, like I would give her a good a good chance. And in general, I I don't like actually gamble, but I would bet on Alaska Natives continuing to handle uh, colonialism effectively. Uh, Julian, thank you so much for this um, really engaging talk. Um, my question is uh, actually about getting a more pixelated sense, if you will, of the incentives um, behind the Board of Fish, and particularly with regard to something that wasn't mentioned at all in the presentation, but I wondered if you could speak to it, which is militarization. Um, I come from a long line of um, female shellfish divers in Jeju Island, known as Henyo, and one of the things that my ancestors, uh, my family, I've experienced um, is American-backed, American-funded militarization on the island that not only obviously affects the coral reef ecosystems, um, but also increasingly stresses the divers, the henyo, um, including you know, my grandmother, um, my mother um, when she was a child. And um, it's a Pacific story, right? Um, but one of the things, that, one that you know, in equally impacts Hawaii as much as it does Jeju, um, but one of the things that strikes me is that Alaska, like Hawaii, is also one of the most militarized states in the U.S. And especially with what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, um, there is a lot of very worrisome discourse about sort of American national security and Alaska being a site of uh, interest, let's say, um, for the Department of State, uh, the Navy, etc. So I was wondering if you could give us a sense of whether, as is the case in Jeju and Hawaii and so on, there is a... Uh, let's say a symbiotic relationship um, between uh, fisheries departments um, and the sort of level of politics that you've been elucidating for us and military interests in the state more broadly. Yeah, I'm not um, aware of that much interaction between uh, the military and the Board of Fish. Um, I am aware though that there's a, so Paulette, her background is that she's, um, how does she say it? She's Tlingapino or Tlingonese. Um, so her story actually is that her family is Tlingit, uh, Japanese, and Filipino. Um, so her, her ancestors were um, part of the Japanese internment in Alaska, which was part of the, the history of militarism in the state, of course. Uh, a lot of people don't actually know this, but there was also Alaska natives who were interned. Um, because according to the state, they 
looked like they could be Japanese. So if the Japanese were to invade, the concern was that uh, the military could not, wouldn't be able to tell the difference, I guess, uh, which is pretty wild reasoning. And um, the other side of, the, of her family is, is Filipino, and there's a, um, a lot of Thlinket will joke that uh, Filipino food is traditional Thlinket food because there's so much um, intermarriage and relationship between uh, Thlinket and Filipino communities. That mostly has to do with um, the fisheries. So uh, to this day, if you go to fish processing plants, a lot of the people who work in uh, the fish plants are Filipino. Although the other reason why there's a lot of Filipinos in the state is because um, Filipinos disproportionately serve in the military. Um, and so there's a lot of Filipinos in Alaska, uh, as I understand, because of uh, the military presence in the state. So these things are interlinked. I ha I don't, I'm not aware of them uh, colliding at the Board of Fish, but to be honest with you, the Board of Fish is, it's ho it's a, is a whole crazy world. And each, as I understand, each fishery is its own world of different people and players and forces colliding to try to govern how the fish are gonna um, going to be managed. So it, it could be happening in some other uh, fishery that I'm unaware of. Well, I, I hate to cut this short, but we will take more questions at the reception to which all of you are invited um, in Buell Hall, um, which is across campus. Just follow the crowd. If you want to join us, please do. Um, so uh, with that, I think we, it just remains to um, thank you so much for this really wonderful talk. And really, it was just beautiful, as everyone has said, and really meaningful. So thank you. Thank you.